welcome, welcome to HDPP Live on a Saturday night to the UK and around the world with photos, memories and friends. This is HDPP Live. How are you this evening? Are you all well, well, well? District has been present for you, meeting friends old and new, streaming Wednesdays and Saturdays too, with founder members Paul and Sue. The smiles that we bring are a heritage thing. HDPP, keeping history alive. HDPP, streaming HDPP live. When the memory survives. Helps a dreary night go by Where in English six of the best Stupendous quizzical eye The smiles that we bring are a heritage thing go again good evening good evening welcome along yeah give them a clap they do they do so well every week they really really do welcome welcome to hdpp live from hinkley on this sunday night sunday the 14th of april the 14th of april already i can't believe where the time's going uh but there you go we're here once again and as always as you can see straight into the chat room we've got lots of people viewing this evening which is good we've tonight we've got a th we've got a stinker six of the best gonna put old smugly to the test uh mind you he won't be here tonight because he's, he's far too busy working on his book um, so w w I know Kath will have to answer for him, uh, but however, uh, we'll, we'll talk about him in a bit. First of all, what a great week HDPP has had. Seriously, all, all said and done. You're going to see tonight, so I'm giving you plenty of warning, I'm afraid you'll be seeing more of this thing tonight, um, because I'll be showing the video, uh, which uh, was shot by Hinkley Free Press for us uh, at the unveilings of uh, Marjorie Payne's plaque. Um, at, at, down in Argent's Mead and indeed down in the cemetery. So um, if you didn't manage to get there on the day, you're going to see it uh, very, very shortly this evening. We've got a trip to Dudlington, um, just a little short trip there before we go for a big noser uh, with our Steve as well. So uh, it's going to be a nice little evening. Probably won't be quite as long as normal, but that depends on you and how well you do uh, with six of the best. Now, also, I've moved my camera. 
into a slightly different position, which I think actually is probably working a little bit better. Uh, however, that's for me to, to, to worry about and look at, in my word. And I've managed to put enough for dusting on me, head so you don't get too much... Uh, too much dazzle back on your screens. First in the ch in the chat room this evening. Oh my word! Pat Galloway got in first. Hi Pat with a big cooey because all HDPP members identify as a cooey. <laughs> well, you do. You go down Castle uh, and there we go. So Pat's got the first cooey lick, followed by Annabelle with another cooey, um, and Daniel Bly says, "Blimey, early tonight." Welcome. Um, hello to Paul Sue. Everybody else, of course, here. Uh, Dave B even managed on his little boat uh, to get reception for HDPP uh, this evening. So great, Dave. I'm glad you're there too. Going to be testing your your brain cells tonight will be tested. Um, Queen B is here as well. Thank you for joining us, Queen B. Uh, lovely to see you last night while I was washing the car. <laughs> I missed a bit. I did. I couldn't see it and I've missed a bit on the... <laughs> anyway, we won't go there. Uh, hi, Russet. Nice to know you're there. Um, and as I say, <clears throat> uh, I'm already getting thanks from Annabelle this evening as well. That's no problem, Annabelle. We'll sort that out. Dave uh, Dave Allen in uh, Boston in Lincolnshire is here. Jan Kirby's here saying, what a lovely day. Well, it has been. It's been a lovely day. It's going a bit cooler now. Temperature's dropping. A little bit chilly. In Claire. So uh, there we go. Uh, also, uh, just scrolling down very, very quickly as people are chatting, uh, just to let you know, Dangerous Dan is now out of timeout and I've let him back in. I will, I will have strictness in this room, I tell you. So we've let Dangerous Dan back in. Now, if he dares bubble any of the, the things tonight, he'll be in a two week ban. All right, there you go. Kit's here as well. Uh, we're, a lot of us are still recovering after last Saturday night uh, at the ground for our 60 70 to do. It was brilliant. If you didn't come, guys, you missed a great night. And we are going to do another one uh, in September. In fact, this very lunchtime, I was talking to somebody who went, he said, We absolutely loved it. And he was hoping we were going to do one a lot sooner. Um, but Honestly, great night, super stuff, a great turnout. And uh, yes, as we say in Panto, we'll have to do it again then, shan't we? Yeah, absolutely we will. And uh, Tim Townsend's here, Tim and little Jane, who've today been down at Foxton Locks. I know, I've seen the pictures. Uh, look beautiful down there. Uh, a walk round and an ice cream. Yeah, you can't beat it, can you? Now the crops are in, so we can start. Uh, they haven't had a better offer tonight, uh, so they've joined us as well. And Mrs. Smugley's here as well. Like I said, Mr. Smugley has been banned to his room uh, and he's got to do his book. It's a bit like trying to get the kids to do their homework. Have you done your book yet? You're not going out and there's no supper until you've done it. <laughs> He'll be a skeleton. Um, however... <laughs> It's great that you've all joined us here in the chat room. Great. Uh, oh, hello to Kay, to Kay Norton as well. And our, our very own Carol Beasley. Yes. The um, the lady of Burbage. Yeah. She's here as well. I'm glad you're there, uh, Carol. And there we go. Are you all ready for six of the best this evening? Some great questions tonight. If I say so myself, Mrs. G didn't get them all right until just shortly before coming on air because she likes to have a go beforehand, you know. However, so six of the best first, then we'll crack into some videos this evening. Now, as usual, and I'm giving this out, Dangerous Den, do not put any answers in until I tell you to at the end. Jolly good. OK, so starting with six of the best. I wonder if we're going to start in the right place. I never know. Where we're, yeah, oh, we are. That's good. So question number one uh, in local knowledge. I want you to tell me where Rosary House is in Hinkley. You walk by it. You walk by it, trust me, you walk by it, you probably wouldn't know it, but it's there. But where is it? Where in Hinkley is Rosary House? Mm -mm. Trust me, you've walked right by it. You really, really have. That is question number one. OK, we're going to move on, if I get my mouse in the right place, to question number two. So here's your general knowledge question for tonight. What is the name given to the practice of favouring your own relatives? Ooh. Mm. So what is the name given to the practice of favouring your own relatives? Ooh, I didn't know this the other day. I'll be honest. I thought, well, that's a good question. Let's see how they're good there. By the way, Carol Beasley says, bless you, Paul. She says, my mother uh, would have another opinion of me. She thought I was a right little madam. <laughs> 
Okay, moving on to question number three. So find the words. Here you go. I'll leave it on the screen. We'll come back to it in a few moments' time. There it is. <clears throat> it's a film. That's all I shall tell you at the minute. Uh, if you fill in the missing letters to that, you'll get... You will get a film. And pr you will. Once you get... And once you get one word, you'll get the lot. It's, it's really it's as simple as that. So it's probably not as difficult as it looks. Have a look at that. I will repeat this in just a few moments' time. So if you can't get your dashes uh, in the right place, don't worry, we'll come back to it in just a moment's time. That is question three. It's a film. Find the words to make a film. There it is. Question number four. Oh, now, I mean, I've, got to, I've got to click a button here. So I want you to guess... What was, oh gosh, can I stop that music? Or oh, I can mute that music in a minute. I've just got to hit that. Ding. Right. What is this theme tune? You know you've heard it. Oh no, wow. Oh no, it's, it's an earworm now. So, what was this theme tune from? Oh, that's got some of you going now, hasn't it? There you go. It was a, it was, it was great on the TV. It really was. But what is that music? We will come back and play it uh, very, very shortly. Okay, we move on. I'll replay that in just a few minutes' time. Can can you that now name me these two faces from seventies TV? Oh, Paul, stop it. You're killing us. You're killing us. Yeah. These two famous faces from the TV of the 1970s. I oh, want their names, please. Uh, don't put their names. Dennis, don't put the names up. I'm just telling you. Right. These two, these two faces from the 1970s TV. Who are they? I want their names, please. That is question number five. On to question number six. Here is your anagram. And because I've been a bit pushed for time, this is also a film from the 1970s. A film from the 1970s. Everybody's heard of this one. They know it. Trust me. Um, there you go. Understate video phone. That's it. Rearrange that. Rearrange that. And you'll have a classic, a classic film from the 1970s. Often on the TV these days. Um, that's it. Right. We will now go through it all again and give you the questions one more time before we have a film this evening. Here we go. So, question one, where is Rosary House? Which, incidentally, Mason Moore said, uh, he said, oh, by the way, he says, um, <clears throat> he said, easy. Any free press reader who picked up last night's story will find that answer. <laughs> well, that's up to them, isn't it, Mason? So, where is Rosary House? Trust me, you have walked right by it and probably never known. You'll find out by the end of the programme if you don't know. Question two, what's the name given to the practice of favouring your own relatives? And it's not favouritism. <laughs> so it's, a, it's a much different word. Same sort of thing, though, I suppose. So that is question number two. Question number three, find the words. I'll leave this on the screen just a couple of moments longer this time. Fill out those dashes and you will, you will find you have got a film. And it's a film from the 1990s. That's as much as I'm saying, but don't say any more, Paul. You'll give it away, OK? Fill in those, and you will find the title um, of a. Yeah, it was a mass. It was a big film, and um, it's well known. You get one word of that, you'll get the lot. Simple as that. Okay, lovely. So, mm -mm -mm. yeah, Mason, Mason saying earworm. You've cursed me with the HDPP one. He said he can't stop singing HDPP. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> okay, moving on. Guess the theme tune. Here it comes. What do you think that's to, eh? It's a TV theme. I wonder if you can remember. I used to like watching it as well. It's a great programme. Really, really good. Right. So that is the... That is our guest, the theme tune. Write the theme tune, sing the theme tune and all the rest of it. And 
you will now find if you can name these two artists, these two uh, TV, um, these two, I say artists, they're, they're two well known faces on the TV in the 1970s. Okay. Very well. By the way, Kath Dent said, John's got the film. Listen, he should be upstairs doing that book. We're going to have a serious go at him getting this bloody book done. I'm getting lots of people asking me. Some people think it's a, it's an urban legend about this book now. People, yeah, yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah. Anyway, because he said, John's got the film. Fill the, and fill the words in. Yeah. Get back up into that room and get that book done. Who are these two famous faces from 70s TV? And the Anneogram... Understate video phone. Understate video phone. There you go. Rearrange that. You will get a classic 1970s film. And it is. It's on the TV lots of times. Uh, that's what you need to do. So I think, I think so far that that is pretty good so far. We're going to have a film in just a few moments time while you're working on your six of the best. Wow. OK, then uh, just while I sort myself out here, and just before I give you the video, show you the video uh, shot by Hinkley Free Press uh, for us on Thursday because it was a great day. Uh, it's a great day. Um, I'm going to show you just a little a little featurette. We've, we've had it before, but it's nice. And particularly anybody watching tonight that's uh, uh, probably first time in, if this is your first time watching, brilliant. Where else would you find rubbish on a Saturday, Sunday night here? Yeah, I know the main TV is full of it. So you might as well watch it here and do it local. Keep it local. It all adds up. Let's have a little featurette on Dadlington. This may just look like a normal small village church found in a countryside village. However, Dadlington Church holds a rather interesting and dark secret that makes it incredibly unique. Just a few miles from here is one of the most important battle sites in medieval England, where the Battle of Bosworth Field took place and where Richard III was defeated by Henry Tudor's Lancastrian army. Also a few miles away is a small village named Stoke Golding, where Henry Tudor was crowned Henry VII after Richard III's crown was retrieved from the battlefield. Here, right in the heart of Leicestershire, where the battle that changed the face of English history took place and ushered in the Tudor dynasty, the most notorious of England's royal families, is Dallington Church, the place where hundreds of soldiers who fell in the battle were buried in mass graves. So join us today as we look at the church that has hundreds of medieval soldiers buried beneath it. And remember, as always, to support our channel, please make sure to subscribe. Dadlington itself had a significant role to play in the deciding Battle of the War of the Roses, and historians consider that the battlefield on which the Battle of Bosworth took place was in fact closer to Dadlington than the traditional site of Ambien Hill. Richard III, the last Plantagenet king, had been on the throne for two years before he met Henry Tudor's army in Leicestershire, and although the battle was fierce, it was rather short. Richard III had his army camped out on Ambien Hill, and on the morning of the 22nd of August 1485, a battle between the two sides was inevitable. When the fierce fighting began, it seemed that Richard III had the beating of Henry Tudor. However, the key turning point was when a third army of approximately 5,000 soldiers, under the command of the Stanleys, stood on high ground near Stoke Golding, observing. When this mercenary army waded in to support Henry Tudor, the whole tide of the battle shifted against Richard. The Stanleys surrounded Richard and his knights, and during the latter stages of the battle Richard was unhorsed. The traditional story states how he was caught inside a muddy bog, and his horse struggled to get out of the quagmire. Richard before this had shown himself as a rather skilled soldier, who had killed Henry Tudor's standard bearer, and also unhorsed Sir huge John Cheney, the former standard bearer of Edward IV. When he was caught in this bog, things changed to a huge degree, and Richard uttered the words, God forbid that I retreat one step. I will either win the battle as a king or die as one. Richard III was then embroiled in bloody hand-to-hand -hand fighting and bravely fought whilst in the thickest press of his enemies. He came allegedly within a sword's length of Henry Tudor and winning the battle before he was suddenly surrounded by Sir William Stanley's forces and brutally killed. It has been reported that Halbert from a Welshman struck the final death blow and this conclusion was later confirmed when Richard's skeletal remains were discovered and analysed. It showed the king had 11 wounds, with 9 of them being to the head. Following the end of the battle, Richard's forces split up when they heard the news that their king had died. Henry then seized the crown and became king by the rights of conquest, and was proclaimed king nearby at Stoke Golding. 
Now after the battle occurred, the clean-up of the battlefield did begin. Just over a thousand soldiers and men lay dead across the battlefield, and despite this seemingly not being a huge number, the battle only took place over a number of hours. The clean-up operation took a long time, and still today farmers and locals find remains of soldiers from the medieval battlefield inside fields and gardens. In fact, a vast number of remains over the years have been found, which date back to the Battle of Bosworth. Now where does Dallington Church come into this? Well, it was here where a huge number of the fallen soldiers were taken to St James's Church for burial. The church itself dates back to the 13th century, but its role in the aftermath of the battle was hugely important. The local people, along with other soldiers, would bring the dead soldiers, mostly those from Richard's side, up to the churchyard, and in mass graves the soldiers would be thrown and buried within the walls of the churchyard. The churchyard of St James' Church in Dadlington would become the main site where the dead from the battle were interred inside of these pits, and today very small signs mark where those are buried. To bury a huge amount of dead bodies must have meant that the pits are incredibly deep, especially as today a number of more modern burials have taken place inside of the church grounds. St James's Church would be the only recorded burial site so far discovered from the Battle of Bosworth, but you can't rule out that soldiers were buried in other local sites too. Dadlington was very close to the battlefield, hence its selection and importance. In various different books and accounts, Dadlington is referred to as a burial site, and over the centuries discoveries of multiple skulls and bones have been reported. The discovery of these were witnessed by elderly villagers, who still attended the local church. Interestingly, there were also a number of pieces of weaponry and armour unearthed in Dadlington and a nearby area, which also indicates the site had real historical importance. The location of Dadlington Church today has cast doubt over the true location of the battlefield, where the final episode of the War of the Roses took place. Many now believe due to the discovery of artillery, bones and other artefacts that the battle took place around the Fen Lane area, which today appears to be a few flat farmers' fields. The true site of the battle has caused much debate over the centuries, but today it's accepted that this is the location. A source from 1922 describes Dallington as This town stands upon a little hill, having a descent every way. It is not far from Bosworth, and near to the place where King Richard III was fought. It is in the courtyard, where of many of the dead bodies slain in the said battle were buried. Another source also comments how Dadlington Church is very old and simple, and there are no monuments to those who fell at Bosworth. In the 18th century a local historian wrote how Dadlington is situated on rising ground, in a good and heathful air, and about one mile from Stoke, in the road to Bosworth near to the ground where the memorable and decisive battle was fought between the houses of York and Lancaster. So Dadlington Church may seem to be a normal small chapel inside of a sleepy village in Leicestershire, but its story goes a lot deeper than that, for this was a burial site of so many who fell in the midst of battle during the Wars of the Roses. After the battle, Richard's body wasn't buried inside the churchyard. His body and remains were more important for Henry Tudor's claim to the throne after the battle ended. Richard's remains were thrown naked onto a cart and paraded into the city of Leicester before they were displayed inside of Greyfriars Priory in the city. Richard's remains were displayed to ensure the whole population knew that their king was dead and that the reign of one of England's most infamous kings was over. Once again, thanks for watching. To support our channel, please make sure to subscribe. And once again, thank you so much for watching. You always learn a little bit more about our local area. I love that one short, brief, straight to the point, uh, a little bit of history of Dadlington. Okay, right, how are you doing with six of the best? Now, I do have to tell you, um, Mrs. G has just realised she's got six. <laughs> and to be fair, she's got it on her own merit, so well done to her. She's making the tea in a bit. Um, that's her prize, you see. Don't you just love it as well? Now, let me just tell you a couple of things before we go to our, our main video tonight uh, of the unveiling of the plaques in Argent's Mead and Hinckley Cemetery. Uh, I'm going to be showing you that in just a few moments' time. Now, I have just found out um, in the last day or so, our June social night 
we've got the barber surgeon coming. He's he's now got a bionic arm and he's doing okay. And he's, he's still got all his fingers. Um, he is uh, going to be with us for our June social night. That is June the 26th. So I'm telling you in plenty of time um, so you can book that in because don't miss that. It's going to be, it's a fantastic talk. I've heard so much. I've not seen it, but I've heard so much, and I really want to bring that to you. So uh, it's June uh, the 26th. Um, it'd be great um, if you could also yeah, make sure you make that one. I mean, the next few are going to be good anyway. We've got some great things lined up. Um, as I say, we've got our B talk, uh, which incidentally, which, which I thought was last week, uh, sorry, last month, it's this coming month. And actually, it's really good because this is the time of year when we've got to look out for these. They are a serious threat to our native bees. Um, and Dale is going to tell us how, you know, uh, if you see them, what you can do, report it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, and the more we're all aware of this, because our bees are under threat. And without the bees, we will have problems. Trust me. Come along. Uh, though it'll be a short presentation. And I'll do um I'll do a local thing afterwards. But please come along um on uh, Wednesday the twenty fourth of April. Um as I say, it's going to be another very informative night. Absolutely superb it will be. Um then now then what's else on my list tonight? You know? uh, I'm thinking probably in July. Uh well because we we won't have a social in July because. Yours truly uh, needs to find a bit of time to go away and have a little holiday. Um, so, but while thinking, how would you lot feel about HDPPs? Can I have a fanfare? Hang on, I just need to, can I have a fanfare? Yes. And now, ladies and gentlemen, HDPP proudly present A night at the museum. How would you like? Um, to, we'll make a, a, a load of us up to go down, have the have the museum to ourselves. Uh, you know, like book it for us, and we'll go down and descend on the museum. I thought there's a thing to do, um, and you know, something like that would be good. Would you be interested in a night at the museum? Mm -hmm. A night at the museum. So it'll just be for HDPP members. We'll be able to go down, have the place to ourselves. We'll be able to have a cup of tea. Uh, and stuff. I think that'd be a good night, and also it would do the museum good because they can count the footfall. So, um, how about that? Tell me what you think in the chat room. But I think that'd be a good idea. Something we can do, um, and if, we, if that goes well, I've got a couple of ideas um, where maybe we can do a couple of um, uh, ex, ex, extracurricular activity. How's that? That'd be good. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. And, and David S, as you say, I've never been to the museum. Well, this would be a great time. Come with us. Come with us. Alan Crop, yes, please. Kath Denny, I fancy a night at the museum. Yeah, and, he, and Denny says, there we go. Right, well, what I'll do, some, and I'll arrange it for some time in July, because, like I say, uh, I will be away the week we'd normally have the social, so it won't be on a, that time. So, But I'll try and arrange um, you know, a time... Uh, probably a week before I go away on holiday, um, where you know we'll, I'll, I'll have a word with Philip and Anne at the museum. Uh, we'll book it. We'll go down, and it's a great place. I went Saturday morning, took uh, the the grandchildren. They loved it. They honestly, they really loved it. We just stayed long enough for them to get a get a bite of it, so to speak. They were they were knitting socks on the Hanton knitting machine. Uh, they loved the dressing up bit. Uh, so really, really good. So yes for the museum. Look, the answer's no, not now. Dangerous Den. Watch it. He's so dangerous on that keyboard. He said your answer's now. <laughs> okay, that's that. So yeah, okay, I'll sort that out for July time and I'll get back to you with a date. But yes, the barber surgeon will be with us on June the 26th and apparently... Apparently, uh, Mr. Smuggly is going to come that night. Why is he so smuggling? That is because he has lots of this stuff. They're piled high in his garage now. He's so smug with it. Uh, Mr. Smuggly will be with us on that night. So. <laughs> right, let's get to the business end. Last week, uh, we had a real special time. And thank you to all of you because you helped make this happen. Uh, we, we, as a group, uh, finally got 
Marjorie Payne commemorated in Argent's Mead and indeed on her resting place uh, in Hinckley Cemetery. Um, it was a great, a great day. And in fact, um, as you're going to see from the video that comes up now, first of all, we'll be starting in Argent's Mead. So if you wasn't there for that one, uh, you're going to see how we did that. That was um, uh, just a, a, just a few minutes, uh, just to give a general introduction to the people that was there uh, so they could get an idea of why there were all these people gathered around. Uh, and then we went down to Hinckley Cemetery where the HDPP identical plaque uh, was unveiled on, on Marjorie's grave. Um, for me, it was a real sense of achievement and something which I've always felt should have been done a long time ago. It's done now. Uh, I'm very content with it. And uh, the, the actual... Order of service, which I'm just going here, which you're going to see in a minute. The order of service, which uh, we've got to do it that way, for Marjorie by uh, Sellers, were fant it was absolutely fantastic. So, with no further ado, I've been teasing you long enough. So I have. So, uh, and thanks to Mason Moore uh, of Hinkley Free Press, who videoed this for me. I took one to a picture, but, yeah, we've got the video, which is great. So, um, let's just have uh, this feature... Thanks to HDPP and, and everybody that came along on the day. Uh, we'll have our little tribute to our Marjorie Payne right now. Good morning. It's lovely to have this nice little gathering today um, in memory of a wonderful lady. A lady who um, uh, had long, has long been gone from, from here but who has left uh, a wonderful legacy for the whole town. I started researching Marjorie oh, quite a few years ago now, but it wasn't until last year and I thought, wouldn't it be nice that future generations would know about Marjorie, her work, um, and this wonderful place which we all use on a daily basis called Argent's Mead. For those of you that don't know, Marjorie um, was very community minded and she was a driving force behind Hinckley getting its own war memorial uh, just there at the top of the mead. Um, so much so, her fundraising efforts um, was so, so important to ensure that, uh, that, that it happened. It meant a lot to her. She was a very generous lady she was a big supporter of the Royal British Legion and I'm delighted that they are represented here today. Upon her death in 1946, uh, she bequeathed this land. She had already given the, uh, the council uh, uh, access to the land to allow access indeed to the war memorial uh, because that was all once private ground as was where we're standing today. Uh, in 1921 she asked the council, would you look after it, no rent or anything, please do. Upon her death in 46, sadly, um, which means she was only in her 60s, um, so her, her gift to the town of the Mead uh, was very, very welcome by the town and uh, we'll be hearing more uh, about this later when we go to Hinkley Cemetery. The various, the various um, good causes she believed in and helped, believed or not, ladies and gentlemen, uh, amongst other people, but she, get, she donated £5,000 to help buy a tank for the war effort. Um, she was very much, like I say, for the Legion uh, and also the local handicap groups and stuff. She was so community-minded, it's just, I just wish we had more people like Marjorie uh, with us today. I do want to thank Hinkley and Bosworth Borough Council for their wonderful support after I brought this to their attention um, because obviously as time goes on these sort of things get for, sort of forgotten about, they get buried in the sands of time whereas now future generations will know the story behind Marjorie Payne and her wonderful, wonderful donation of this land to be used every day. Imagine we couldn't have the car show here uh, if it, this wasn't here. We couldn't have all the events that the council put on right here in the heart of town. And if it wasn't for Marjorie being so generous, she could have very easily w uh, wanted this land to be sold 
um, have, could have been built on for all we know but Marjorie could see she wanted to leave this for us and I think uh, it is truly amazing. I also want to thank uh, Joseph Barsby of uh, G Cellar of uh, Upper Bond Street who have been so wonderfully supportive who have helped supply the plaque and indeed on Joseph's advice um, we've come to today's uh, uh, wonderful time to unveil this plaque. You are all welcome to come and join us uh, very soon uh, down uh, at Marjorie's resting place in the cemetery. If you would like to come down uh, we would love you to be there um, where we can unveil the Hinckley District Past and Present identical plaque um, and a very short dedication service. So can I ask um, some members uh, of the council to come here and help us unveil this plaque to Marjorie Payne, please. <laughs> See, Tom Paul, and so, right, okay. I'm going to stop you there. Okay, right. I'm going to stop you there and right, check sure. that we can see you all, okay? Right, okay. okay. No. <laughs> No, it's, it's a, a fly. fly. <laughs> <laughs> we gave the pack another good clean before okay, before good. we start. <laughs> That's lovely. Hold it there, and um, whenever you're ready. Okay. Let's shoot out after three, two, one. <laughs> three, two, one. Since starting Hinkley District Past and Present back in 2015, I was always interested in the name of Marjorie Payne. I knew she had given Argent to me to the town, but I didn't know anything about the lady herself. Now, her grandfather, Daniel Payne, had a small hosiery business in Stoke Golding. Now, he must have been quite a shrewd businessman, as in 1874, he moved the business to Hinkley into Wood Street, where he had the very first steam-powered factory in the town. If you think about it, this was the new technology, and so the business grew, and so did his family. His son, William Hurst Payne, who was born in 1855, later took over the business, uh, and it provided, it provided large contracts to the war office. He also played a big part in church life at St Mary's Church, between 1874 and 1884, being very proactive during the big restoration works of the Reverend Disney uh, that gave us the church that we see today. He was also a justice of the peace and the firm continued to grow and so did the family. So the firm moved to bigger premises in Upper Bond Street and Factory Road. Marjorie was one of two children of William and Mary. Marjorie's eldest sibling, Harry, died in his teens and he is commemorated on a brass tablet in St Mary's Church and the family lived at The Lines in Derby Road. Now not having any children of her own, she was very community minded. She was the driving force behind getting Hinkley's War Memorial created and donating land to afford access to it. During the Second World War, she personally donated £5,000 towards buying a tank. Imagine £5,000 back then, a lot of money. Now, upon Marjorie's death in 1946, she bequeathed as a gift the land between St Mary's Church and the Castle Mound, which we know as Argent's Mead. And her will reads as follows. I devise to the Urban District Council of Hinckley free of all duties, the close of land lying near to St Mary's Church, Hinkley, and known as Argent's Mead, which has been leased by me to the said council upon trust to maintain the same forever as an open space or recreation ground for use of inhabitants of the town of Hinkley and neighbourhood. Now, whilst I was doing my research to Marjorie, I suddenly became very much aware of how generous and community minded she really was. She supported the National Lifeboat, the Seaman Mission, the Hinkley Hospital, St Mary's Church, St Catherine's Church and the church at Stoke Golding. 
She also donated generously to the local handicap society. I think one of the most touching things she did was to provide for the poor of St Mary's Hinckley blankets and coal for the poor and infirm at Christmas to the value of £2,500. She also wished for a home of the Limes in Derby Road to be converted into a soldier's convalescent home to be run by the local branch of the Royal British Legion. Sadly, this did not come to pass due to the cost involved and the conversion and the Legion did not have the relevant funds. I would like to thank the members of Hinkley District Past and Present whose kind donations made this plaque possible. Thanks to Susan Chambers of Hinkley and Bosworth Borough Council for her help and cooperation. Special thanks to Joseph Barsby of G. Cellar Funeral Directors for his expert help and support that made this possible. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all. Um, this wonderful plaque from um, that uh, Joseph designed and done for us um, is truly fantastic. I'm so, so proud uh, that Joseph and I can unveil this this morning for Marjorie and her family. Almighty God, by your power and love, all things are sanctified and made perfect. Be merciful to us and bless us. Let your face shine upon us and prosper the work of your hand through Jesus Christ our Lord. And Heavenly Father, help us to entrust our loved ones to your care. When sorrow darkens our lives, teach us to look to you and to remember the cloud of witnesses by whom we are surrounded, especially your servant, Marjorie Payne, as we give thanks for every remembrance of her and give thanks for her gener generosity and legacy. Grant to her and to all your people the rest and peace which you give to your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Dedicate this memorial to the me memory of his servant, Marjorie Payne, in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Carry standards. Order standards. So, as we conclude, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's been an honour for me uh, to get this sorted. I feel that today we've finally done the right thing after many years in commemorating Marjorie, a truly lovely, generous lady, and by unveiling these plaques today, here in Hinkley Cemetery and in Argent's Mead, now her name will travel down future generations of the town as they learn about this amazing lady. Thank you Marjorie for your wonderful gift to the town. We are eternally grateful. May you rest in eternal peace. God bless. Thank you all ladies and gentlemen for coming, it means a lot to us all. Thank you very, very much indeed. Thank you. And what a great, great day it was. It was so poignant. 
Um, and it was lovely to see the HDPP members that came along to the cemetery uh, and those indeed that came to Argent's Mead. Um, the only thing that sadly spoiled it was the construction work. <laughs> sadly, in the car park at, uh, in Argent's Mead, never mind, those things happen. And of course, the awful noise coming from the, uh, from the, from the big pit. Um, I don't know whether they were still trying to bail it out or not. I don't know. <laughs> But anyway, those things happen. Unfortunately, yeah, well, it was a bit of a shame with the noise level there. But there we there, there we have it. Um, a great day. We all we should all be very very proud of what the group has done. Um, and we, we I'm sure we'll be picking another uh, topic uh, which we can put some input to. Uh, you would have seen already the new information boards that have been placed uh, in Castle Street uh, and indeed in um, in in the borough. Um, yeah, these heritage uh, information boards, they're very, very good. Uh, look out for them. Uh, plenty of uh, plenty of stuff there. OK, right. We're going to go through the questions one more time. No, not yet, Dennis. Not yet. We're going to go through the questions one more time. Then we're going to have a nosy and then we will do the answers. Hold him back. Oh, they put a straight jacket on. I just made me wonder. I could see a picture of Daniel. <laughs> My mind, I know, it's terrible. So, let's go through one more time our six of the best this evening. Question number one. Uh, where in Hinkley is Rosary House? The answers are out there, trust me. The answers are out there. So, that is question number one. Question number two. What is the name given to the practice of, of favouring your own relatives? I nearly said flavouring them. <laughs> Oh dear, this water's so strong. Uh, question number three, find the words to this film. Yes, fill that in. You get one word, you'll get the lot. Trust me, you really, really will. Okay? Lovely. That is question number three. Jan Kerbs, I've given up on the quiz tonight. I've only got one question. Listen, this is, I promise you these, you know, they, they just... Bear with us, John. Bear with us. Question number four. Guess. Guess the theme tune. Here it comes. And if you thought it was Grace Brothers, it's not. Going up. Going up. <laughs> it's not. It's not that. I'll tell you now. Dear. So that is Guess the Theme Tune. We'll give you the answer to that uh, after our nosy this evening. Now then, can you name these two uh, faces from the 1970s? In fact, one of them um, uh, got a local connection to, to Enkler. But these were on the TV in the 70s. Yeah, but what were their names? Mrs G finally got the last name uh, a little while ago. She she was getting really worried. She couldn't shout, it's driving me nuts. The man with the pipe, it's driving me nuts. Yeah, but she's done it. So I want their names, please. OK, I love it how Russet's got 1.5 answers correctly. Well done, Russet. Here is the anagram, a film from the 1970s. You would have seen it. You would have seen it. Rearrange that. You'll get the, the film title. That is the anagram question. OK, right. OK, it is now time. By the way, we're going, so we're going to do a night at the museum, uh, which is uh, going to be good at uh, um, in, in July. So that's going to be something well worth looking out for as well. We're trying to get these, ecul see, these, these little extracurriculum activities. I think it's good. OK, good. Uh, Alan says, only one for us at best. Oh, I can't believe it. Come on, come on. We can do this. By the way, just before I do the nosy, because this program's live. So as Chuck comes in, I can respond to it. And that's the beauty of doing this. I was impressed, by the way, uh, that Alan Crop mentioned uh, that, um, uh, that yes, that said, my grandfather, Thomas Stretton Payne, which I've got in my notes here, uh, my grandfather, Thomas Stretton Payne, was a director of the Daniel Payne hosiery in the premises that are now housed the Bond Street Motors and Ray Motor Factors. Now he tells me, he obviously didn't want to come and help, I would, anyway, that's an interesting, and I do have that name, because um, I found a newspaper cutting with his name on the other day, uh, Thomas Stretton Payne. Interesting. So you've got a Stretton Payne, a Hurst Payne, interesting, isn't it? Don't you just love it? Today, by the way, I was um, I I went to the Crown and Anchor today. This morning, I visited the Crown and Anchor. 
pub that was in Castle Street. Well, the building's still there. And uh, Lisa invited me to go up and have a nose there. Oh, wow, brilliant. Straight down the cellar. Here we go. <laughs> Straight down the cellar. Uh, and to see the vaulted roof down there. It's as dry as a bone and, and not musty or damp. Incredible. Um, so that was great. So uh, Lisa, I did say I'd give you a mention. I don't know if she's going to watch tonight. Uh, but thank you very much for letting me come and have a nosy down your... <laughs> not saying the sense of else. Come and have a nosy down your cellar. Yeah. All right. Oh, I could have got in trouble for something there. Cool. Mm. Right. Time for a nosy. Yes, Mr. Mr. Picker. And Mr. Nosy himself has been about. And uh, he has left us with another great nosy. One we've not done before. Settle back and enjoy our nosy. And then, Dennis, then, Dennis, you can start thinking about doing your answers. But, but not until. Uh, wrong button, Paul. You need to press this one. No, it's not that one. It's this one. <laughs> Oh, wait a minute, he's all over the place now. It's nosy. I'll this is the possession one I want. of this map here. I mean, granted, you know, I wasn't giving it in a 16th century tavern in Market Bosworth or something. I did order it off the Ordnance Survey <laughs> website, but I've not used it yet. The Rugby and Daventry edition. So that would do nicely for today. Thank you very much. Hello, hey up and hey diddling, my name is Steve and once again it's a great big warm welcome from myself to Let's Explore. I hope you're very well. Right then, what we're doing today? Well in today's video we are indeed back to doing what we sometimes do best, a bit of railway bashing. Oh shit, you know the drill and dealio by now surely. But as you know for the last couple of years on and off I've been exploring parts of the Great Central Railway. Now the last time we explored some of the GCR was down at Lutterworth down to Shawwell or Shawell, is it? I can never remember how you really pronounce the place, to be honest with you. Shawell. But it's now time to start exploring it again. And I've brought you down to an area of rugby known as Brownsover we're starting off today. And I could just see something very grand through there. But as you expect with the Great Central Railway, it was all pretty grand. And I tell you what, this does look grand. And it reminds me of a bridge that I found at Lutterworth that was culverted beneath. And I think we might be in business straight the way here, but I'll get you over to the maps first. All right then, so in this week's video, we are indeed off to the North Warwickshire town of Rugby to further explore the Great Central Railway, which actually started off life as the Manchester, Sheffield and Lincolnshire Railway, before of course extending southwards to London and changing the name to the GCR. Now I will warn you in this video, I'll go off on a bit of a tangent today, because my nose takes me over to the, the Oxford Canal, which runs pretty much adjacent to this railway in parts, because I found some structures beneath that canal, beginning with C. Now if you've been watching my videos for long enough ladies and gentlemen you will indeed know what the C word is but you know I'm in the vicinity and I weren't going to miss out on nosy business like that but at the end of the day the Oxford Canal in its own right is an amazing old transportation system that came a long time before this great central railway did of course but this was a great little nosy today and the plan was of course where I'm pointing there to the north of the picture courtesy of Google Earth we started there at Brownsover a great big urban sprawl to the north of Rugby and finished to the south of the picture there because I wanted to go and locate the former Rugby station on the GCR and I tell you what, when I got down to the station I was amazed by the job that they'd done down there doing a bit of fancy artwork, graffiti now I'm not usually a big fan of graffiti but this graffiti were very tasteful anyway, without any further ado, let's go and have a noser Jesus Christ, Mary and Joseph, look at this that's gargantuan, that is, ain't it? I think this might be the River Avon, I think. But wow, can we... Uh, I've actually got my wellies on for a change as well. Can we get a bit closer? Because it's a extraordinary bridge, this is. It's huge. It's mahoosive, as they say in Northern Macedonia. Wow. Something else, that is, isn't it? I mean, just look at that arch. You've got one, two, three, four, five, six brick thick arch there. That's massive. 
Getting right bollocking off a spring of spaniel here. Eh? Excellent that bridge was, weren't it, with the Avon going underneath. But we've got another one here, identical, but it just ain't got water going beneath it. But this little area here is very interesting and I'll tell you why. Because what you're looking at here, it doesn't look like it anymore because there's houses over there, it's all changed. But this is an old section of the Oxford Canal. Now the Oxford Canal joined Coventry to Oxford and I think opened in around about 1790. Now this was engineered by the legend himself, an absolute genius, James Brindley. So Brindley then, he was the main engineer of the Oxford Canal, which was 90 miles long. So I think it took them pretty much 20 years uh, to build it from Coventry uh, down to Oxford. But Brindley actually died in 1772. Um, so he never actually finished the canal, which is a proper shame. And yes, I do understand this is a railway video today. But what's really interesting is, in the 1770s, when he was made engineer on this canal, it was on £200 a year. Now, in 2024 prices, that comes out at just over £45,000 a year. But don't take too much notice of that, because if he'd have been around this day and age, he'd have been maybe on a couple of hundred thousand, maybe not quite that much. It'd have been on a hell of a lot of money. But the fascinating thing is about someone like Brindley is that the Oxford Canal wouldn't have been his only project. It'd have had numerous projects going on at the time. Now, this is before the Great Steam Age, which you know we're exploring today. You know, Brindley dies in 1772. This railway opened to coal traffic in either 1897 or 18... 98 and well over 100 years before this was built so can you imagine Brindley probably a workaholic a bit like you know later on after then Isambard Kingdom Brunel uh, I think he worked himself to death maybe the same for Brindley I'm not really sure but Brindley had been traveling up and down the country you know surveying areas and engineering them for his clients etc and you know all on horseback crazy really but he may have walked what remained of that towpath back there once? Who knows? Anyway, let's get on with exploring this railway. Right, so I think I've actually walked as far as I can for now because what you've got here is an abutment and I think there was a bit of a viaduct going across here. We'll have a little look round here just to see if we can see out, but I'm pretty sure I've got to go a different way. Right, so there you go. Oh, whoops a daisy. Wow, look at this. <laughs> Amazing, really, isn't it? Oh, I tell you, bloody what I have seen. Hey, look down there, look. That's a cool, that's a big cool bit. If it, yeah, it is. Bloody hell, we've got to get down there. It's a good job I come down here, were not it? Wow, look at that. Right, so I've just got to this point from up there. I've walked down here and look at this massive abutment. It's beautiful. So you've got this buttress here and one over there, so I'm pretty confident then that the railway line will come in over the top here like that on a huge viaduct by the looks of this. Um, I tell you what, it was massive as well. I mean, you'll struggle to appreciate what I'm probably talking about here with it, with it being on camera. You'd have to be here stood next to me, I think, but wowzers. But we need to get down there. I've spotted something. Right then, so courtesy of our Warwickshire, you're looking at a, a fantastic photograph looking southwards uh, of this viaduct down here at Rugby. Now, where the arrow's pointing now, that's roughly where we were stood when we first approached this uh, megalithic railway structure. And it's fantastic this is, because this was taken apparently at break time. And as you can see, you've got some navvies there. Some of them are actually leaning against the um, the abutment, actually looking like uh, they're asleep. Mind you, how, how hard they used to have to work, they probably were tired to be honest, but this was built between two embankments, of course, and when you build a viaduct or a bridge, you have to build your structure first, and then you build your earth embankments either side. Now, of course, this is looking south. Now, we need to go south to locate what remains of Rugby Station a little later in the video, but on the southern end of this structure that you can't see, of course, that goes to another earth embankment, but after that, it actually turns into a bit of a steel viaduct that actually spans the London and North Western Railway main lines, which is still there now. Um, so you'll see that a little bit later in the video. Anyway, let's go culvert bashing on the Oxford Canal. Wow, well, we're doing what we love best on a Sunday. We're in the Andy Jones Inn. 
here, there and bloody everywhere. You've got to love it. Hey, what we've got here then? Uh, right, a bit of a, what's that? Is that stone or concrete? No, it's blue engineering brickwork topped with concrete, a retaining wall. Probably something to do with all this water here when that's in flood. Did you hear that then? That was a train on the main line. So we've got to go round, haven't we? Can't get over that. Look at that. That's, un that's unbelievable, Jeff. Isn't it? Bloody hell. Bloody hell, Del. Shit in hell. It's only triple whammy, ain't it? Wowzers. Now, this central one, I bet it's going to be a bit deep, but. That one up there, that looks a bit walkable. Oh, Christ's sake. Get off your... Right. Wow, these are massive. Do they know it's Christmas time? Oh, wow, look at this. But the water level's a bit high in them. For Christ's sake, I bring, do you know what? I don't bring me wellies out. I can't go somewhere. I bring me wellies out. I need me pissing waders, don't I? I can't win. We can get in that one, though. I hope my missus ain't got one of them tracking apps on me on this phone, you know. Because if she's watching it now, she'll be seeing me like, di -di 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 di <laughs> all over the place. You'll think it's malfunctioning. Yeah, this is the canal. I thought it would be. As he emerges from the undergrowth. So yeah, there you are. James Brindley's Oxford Canal. Not finished off by him, of course, because unfortunately he died in 1772. But we can try and get down here. Oh, I tell, I tell you what, this has ended up better than I thought it were going to, this video. Wow. Oh, I love the, I, I, you know, I'm not even gonna bang on about it. I don't even know what I'm talking about anymore. Right, so I'm not sure if I mentioned this earlier when I started banging on about the Oxford Canal, but these three culverts here may have actually been built in 1820 thereabouts. Now, of course, the canal is much older than that, but around this area, they had to straighten it out in the 1820s because it was very bendy in places, of course. So this may have been built in the 1820s, but it, it might be an old one. It may have been even designed by the great man himself, Brindley. Yes, and we can get in. Happy days. You knew as soon as I seen this, I was going in there. And this side is the driest. Oh, this is interesting in here, look. It gets wider. I wonder why. It's almost like a canal tunnel in its own right, this is. Look at this lot. Hmm. That's interesting. Very interesting. It's almost like it's been extended. Um, so maybe this part of the canal was altered. I'm really not sure if I'm honest with you. Yeah, I like that. Look at it from here, look. See it? Quite cool, that is. Where the River Avon is here, going beneath this gargantuan bridge here. It's incredible. Such fantastic engineering. There's another one up there in the distance. That looks like a triple and an old triple whammy. I can't rest. I've got to look before I go. Sorry. I've got to... <laughs> it's got to be done. I can't leave it. It's like an OCD thing. I mean, look at it. That don't even look like it was built in the 1890s, does it? It looks like it was built 50 years ago. It's mad. And like on these wing walls here, look at the coping. Still got the coping there, look. Beautiful. What a beautiful structure. It's missing on the other side. Not to worry. This is a totally different culvert. There's another big one over there. The triple whammy we've seen down there, that is taking another brook beneath it. But where I'm stood now is a bit of a floodplain for the River Avon. You've got these beautiful egg-shaped, oh, Scheisenhausen. Beautiful egg-shaped culverts here. Built just like old Victorian sewers. I'm not going to go all the way through there, don't worry, I just have to come over here. So I've not been through these, but there's another big one over here. Wow. Holy schmoly. It's supposed to be a bloody railway video. Mind you, I know, I know a lot of you appreciate this stuff as much as I do at the end of the day. It's, it's there and I'm not going to miss out on it. You know, it's, it's incredible infrastructure made a long time ago that still does its job in 2024. 
quite amazing really. I mean, we don't build anything like that now to have that sort of longevity, you know. So what we're going to be graced with shortly is another Oxford Canal aqueduct taking River Avon beneath it. So let's see what we've got. Oh, that's beautiful. That is stunning. Look at that. Wow, that is absolutely gorgeous. And if you look closely, look. Some standard gauge rail there, look, holding some brickwork up. Can you see? They are. Nice little feature. That is gorgeous. I'm not going to go in there because the river level has risen, as you can see. Uh, if it was a hot day and deep into the summer, I would have ventured down there. I mean, this is a very old structure. And what they've done, they've put some spray crete on here, a type of uh, concrete look on the brickwork. Beautiful. Isn't that nice there? Yeah, I've got a thing about aqueducts. It's just, it's water as well with me. It's how they engineered water and tried to manage and master it. Um, incredible, amazing minds back then. And then of course, I mean, the Oxford Canal would have been dug out by hand as far as we know, but the Great Central Railway, you know, a lot of the work that took place on that, the heavy digging, they were using mechanical excavators assisted by men. It's often quite funny really, because when I think of the Great Central Railway, and you know, a lot of these projects that started using mechanical excavation, Machines, you know, like, like the steam navy, of course. Now, one of them machines, one of the excavators, could actually do the work of a hundred navvies in one day. And you know, when you look at them, as you're looking at now, actually in this area being worked at Rugby, look at the size of it and look at the bucket. So, you think of a hundred men. It's a testament to them what sort of work a hundred men could do for those great mechanical dinosaurs turned up. Right, so we've driven round, and just down here, you've got Abbey Street in Rugby, and for now, touch wood, it stopped raining, but we won't hold as breath, will we? So can you remember earlier, I said to you there was a huge viaduct. Right, so we went Indy Andy Jones in round that former viaduct earlier that spanned between the two embankments, and I said to you that it actually led southwards to a, a steel built structure going over the London and North Western Railway, which is still there, that railway. It's now been electrified, of course, since, and there's a, there's a great big station and what have you there. Beautiful place. But as you can see here, courtesy of our Warwickshire, we're gonna look at two photographs, including this one. It looks like these workers are actually riveting the structure. I might be wrong, that's what it looks like they're doing anyway. And then you've got this other photograph here. Stunning, isn't it? I'm so thankful of these old photographs, you know, taken in the 1890s. Anyway, what we'll do now, we'll, we'll carry on down. We'll just have a little look at what there is left, some abutments and what have you, some stanchions where this used to stand. And then we'll go and try and locate the remains of Rugby Station. Let's go for a noser. So yeah, it would have been an immense structure, this wood, stretched a long way. I imagine all the way to where we was at that abutment, near those fantastic culverts on the canal. And just look at that. What once was a? Ah, so it gets interesting here. Look at this. Typical of the Great Central Railway. Beautiful blue brick retaining wall there at the side of this street. But just down here, we've indeed got a bridge, as you can see. And we've got a dog going mad somewhere. They're all at it. It's going to be like Call of the Wild in a minute by the sounds of it. Nice that, isn't it? I love how they put that steelwork beneath the, the brickwork as well. Yeah, look at this here, look. Got some track here. Lovely. Got another bridge here. Ain't that nice? Clifton Road up there. How do I know that? Because it says Clifton Road on a sign just there. Couple of pigeons going absolutely ape as well. But look at this here. So we've indeed got more remains of track. Just like at the last bridge, you can always tell a great central railway bridge, can't you? Stand out a mile architecturally anyway. And you know, even details like this, where you've got the 
the steel work, and in between you've got the vaulted brickwork. I love to see that. The cutting's got a bit wider, and the next bridge down has got a bit bigger, a bit wider, as you can see. Another fine example of a great central railway bridge, and that is Lower Hill Morton Road. That's where we are. So we're on track. I tell you, hey, that's a good bit of graffiti. Look at that. Wow. If you're going to graffiti, that is the way to do it. That is incredible. Look at that. Look at the train. I've never seen anything quite like that. That is amazing. Look at the detail. Look at the glow of the light. Wow, that's incredible, man. That was incredible, wasn't it, that bit of graffiti? Amazing. And do you know what? A lot of the time when we explore these places, there's graffiti everywhere. Usually, it's swear words and really badly drawn genitalia. Do you know what I'm saying? Anyway, I digress. Right, we have another bridge. Got some more track down here as well. And there. And some nice graffiti as well again. A train this time, wow. Look at this. I gotta be honest with you, I think this is the prettiest bridge that I've ever seen. Well, the underneath of a bridge anyway, with what they've done down here. Look at this graffiti here. This is amazing. Rotary Club of Rugby wishes to thank the sponsors of the Great Central Way Centenary Project. Wow. And this is the site of the station. I'm getting carried away again, and I? That's incredible, that is. Absolutely beautiful. Of course, you've got the old rail down here as well. Look at this archway. So I think this would have been, by the looks of that, steps down from the road up there into the station. Yes, I'm pretty sure then that this archway, there would have been some steps here. Uh, I mean, they're not here no more. You've got a house up there, so that's been built in the last 30 or 40 years. So I think there would have been steps here, actually, next to this retaining wall, I reckon. So. Nice little feature though, isn't it? Look at this here. Look at that woodpecker. <laughs> that is stunning. Yes, so through here then. Wow. So look at this platform. All right then, so what you're looking at here is rugby station platform. Now at this point, my microphone died. That's why I'm narrating. Don't ask because I don't know. So if you imagine then this platform is a bit like one of them posh kitchens you have in your house, if you're a bit well to do. So the main line rails would have gone round the outside of this. So on the opposite side is where the archway was um, with the access down from street level. So really nice feature that. And as you can see now, courtesy of our Warwickshire, we've got some lovely old photographs of the station as well. Fantastic stuff. But I tell you what, the graffiti that I found down here, I was in love with it. I'm not usually a big advocate of graffiti, but when you're going to do it like this, uh, it's fantastic. Uh, it has to be said. Really brightens the place up a bit. A bit stuck for words, really, about this. I think what they've done here is incredible. It looks beautiful. It looks stunning, if I'm honest with you. Amazing. It's like this here. The birds on here. A deer over there. And, so I'm assuming that these are the geniuses that have done the actual artwork down here. I'm assuming that's Instagram as well. So, if that's the case, check these out. Great job. Well, that concludes today's video. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. It's been really good. I know the first part of it, we were looking at canals more than anything, weren't we? You know, them great big culverts and what have you. But I'm going to leave it here today. Uh, I can't get over this, if I'm honest with you. It's absolutely amazing what they've done down here, in my humble opinion. Anyway, if you enjoyed it, please like, subscribe and share. And I'll be seeing you very soon at the next one. Take care of yourselves. Bye. There we go. Great nosy, that one. And I must be honest, Steve, I totally agree about the uh, that graffiti art. Now, that is, like I say, if you're going to do it, do it proper, not just these awful stuff you see uh, in lots of places. Uh, you know, uh, it's great to see art because i think the other stuff where it's just letters guys <laughs> it doesn't really do it does it but they did look good mate uh lots of good comments coming in there uh, as you can see in the chat room uh gone very very well indeed now excuse me just one moment i've got a personal message to convey dennis it's nearly time right 
Okay. Nearly. Okay. So, um, all that remains for us to do now is to go through the answer. That we'll wait, we'll wait, Dennis, for six of the best. We're going to go through it. And you can indeed put the answers in as we go through the questions. Now, uh, don't give me the answer to question four when I'm only on question two. It doesn't work like that. Wait for me to ask you to right, put the answers in. So, here we go. But oh, let's just remind you, by the way, by the way, we're scanning on Saturday. Please, if you've got pictures, come along. You know how it goes then. All right. Okay, six of the best. Here we go then. So I was asking question one. Where in Inkle is Rosary House? Let's see if anybody has got that particular one this evening because that is a... We never used that question before and I guarantee you have walked right by it. You have. Mm-mm. Carol says, I'm guessing Rosary House is something to do with the Catholics. Well, yeah, I imagine it's private walks. Well, you've imagined wrong. But Jan Kirby's come in with it correctly. Uh, John Denny incorrectly. Uh, because the, the what I'm looking for, I am looking for um, Castle Street. R the Rosary House, the ho Rosary House we're looking for in this instance, is the House of Charlotte Brain. Uh, if you go down Castle Street, a brand new information board has been uh, has been unveiled in this last few days. Uh, very comprehensive it is too. So really, really good. Um, so we were looking for Castle Street. So uh, uh, Ch Charlotte Brain's house is known as Rosary House. Now, I do understand why you would say, oh, it'd be by the Catholic Church or something. I totally understand that. But I'm after the Rosary House that was Charlotte Brame's house in Castle Street. So there. Well done, Jan. You see, you can do. You're doing all right. There we go. Have a look at the new um, say the new uh, info boards that have been put in Castle Street. And indeed, the one down uh, in the borough for Joseph Hansom. Uh, very informative. Great to be highlighting our heritage. OK, so give yourself a point if you got that one right. Now... Dennis does admit he didn't know that one, so let's see how we do with question two. Uh, what is the name given to the practice of favouring your own relatives? Yeah, there is a name for it. Can you get it right? I bet some of you have already been in the dictionary uh, to try and find out what it is. Yeah, oh, look, you can tell the educated ones, can't you? Yeah, yeah. It's that word there. Do you, is it Nepo? N nipa, nipa. Anyway, it's that word there. How do you pronounce it, Mrs. Yee? No, she's not going to say now. Is it neopism? <laughs> Neposism. Nip that word there. Yeah, you've got it right. Anyway, that is the correct. I wish I could spell. I wish I could say it now. That is definitely the right answer. Well done. If you've got N E P O T I S M as your answer, because I can't pronounce that. Nip. Nepotism. Nip. Oh, mate. She, the pronunciation department of Hinkley District Past and Present has just gone in. Just a minute. I'm going to, I must do this correctly. I must do this correctly, he said. She's doing it. How do I pronounce it, Mrs. G? Because she won't speak. She, ne, nepotism. Yeah, got it. Moving on quickly before I make a fool of myself. Here is the film. So for you... You're filling all the blanks and you'll get the name of a film. Let's see who gets that. Who has got this one right? Oh, little Jane Brown and John Dennis coming through with the correct answer uh, of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Quite correct. Well done. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles is the correct answer to number three. Very big, uh, it was very big in the 1990s, and of course, enjoyed a reboot uh, in more recent years. Uh, so that's what we're looking for Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Okay, right now, then we move on. Let's see, and I'm just going to see if I can um, if I can stop this music a minute because I am now going to play this. Let's see who gets it right. Here we go. Here's guess the theme tune. Yo. Well, Jane Brown said, well, I thought it was Are You Being Served? And I understand why you would think that. I do understand that because it's got that going up, isn't it? Just there. So I get that. Mr. Smugly comes in with the right one. It's the Vision On theme song. And yes, John, you are correct. It is Vision On. Now, most people associate Vision On with the gallery music. So that's why I chose this because this is not as sort of associable to it. 
there you go. So, oh, I like Dennis Perkins. Is this man about the house? No, it's not. Uh, <laughs> the Persuaders? No, no, no. Vision on. It was a great little program uh, hosted by Tony Hart and Pat Kiesel. Um, and it was just, it was just, you can stop now. It was just a great little program uh, that um, with, with art and stuff and whatnot. Uh, it was just, just a great little thing. So that's the theme tune to Vision On. There'll be another theme tune next week. Okay. Who are these two gentlemen who was on our TV screens in the 1970s? Um, one with a local connection, actually. Uh, let's just see. Jane Brown has got it. Oh, yeah. Well done, Jane. Um, Jane Brown gets this one. Barry, Dennis Perkins, Barry Upton and his granddad. You stop it now. Behave, behave. Um, John Denny says Michael Billington and Jack Hargreaves watch both in the UF show. Well, it's not. It's not Michael Billington, Mr. Mr. Nosy, uh, Mr. Mr. Smuggly. You're wrong. <laughs> I'm sorry to say this is Barry Evans and Jack Hargreaves. Good guess, though, John. I'll, I'll see where you're coming from. Um, and um, sadly, Barry Evans uh, used to live at um, Claybook Magna. And sadly, um, as we all know, very tragically, he was murdered. Uh, I don't know anything else other than that, but sadly that was at Claybook Magna a number of years ago. So there you go. Yeah, I thought it was Burlington because I'm at Myra. No. 70s was a long time. Here come the excuses now for Mr. Smugly. <laughs> back upstairs, back onto that book now. <laughs> yeah. There we go. Yes, and David S. just confirmed what I said. Barry hasn't lived in Claybook. He didn't. Yeah, absolutely. He was. The, the gentleman was doing taxi driving at the uh, end of his career. How sad. That's sad, very sad. OK, moving on to... Coming on to Anagram Question. Another film. Re, if you rearrange understate video phone, you'll get a classic film from the 1970s. My favourite of all time. Absolutely. Jane Brown. You're on fire tonight, Jane. Well done indeed. The answer I was looking for was, and oh, and John Denny's just got in quickly. Yes, okay. The Poseidon Adventure. You know where the where the big ocean liner tips up, which incidentally the remake was a load of rubbish, um, in my honest opinion. Uh, but the Poseidon Adventure uh, of 1972 uh, was a classic, a classic film. So absolutely good. Now it's time to send me in, send me in your scores. Um, some have done well, some have done not so well, um, but that's good. Even Mr. Smugly, he's sort of, a bit like the National yesterday, he sort of oh, fell over a couple of fences, but he got up and, and he got through, so well done. Um, right, well, Russet says, I've only got one and a half. Okay, then. Um, four and a half, I like these halves. Yeah, four and a half tonight, uh, says John Denny. He would have got he would have got five if, if he'd have got uh, Barry Evans right. OK. Daniel Coburn, none for me. Shocking night. Nothing. I must try harder next week. Daniel, I'm surprised at you. I really am. Well done, Jane Brown. Four for us tonight. One and a half for me from a, a very quiet Pat Galloway this evening. Two for Dangerous Dan. But he did manage to keep his hands off the keyboard long enough to play the game tonight. Uh, Alan Crock, one for... One for one for Alan and zero for Marie. Uh, okay, Alan, nice one. And interesting, your your connection to uh, uh, the, the pain factory. Uh, I'd like to find a bit more about that. You'll Anyway, I'll contact you later. Uh, but that's good. So, well done. So, nobody... Mrs. Now, Mrs. G, who is off camera and won't appear because I can't afford it. Um, she, she has... I can honestly vouch for her. She has got six... And she managed to do that without twisting my arm up my back or punching my lights out. So she did quite well, actually. Queen B has got three. And David S said, well, well, more than one this time. Well, there you go. Excellent. Isn't it good fun? Isn't it good fun on a Sunday night? Where else can you find rubbish like this? I tell you, absolutely. It's been great having you uh, with us tonight. Uh, I hope you remember to come back to us uh, next Sunday night. We'll do it again because we'll soon be going, going on uh, a little hiatus, a little sabbatical uh, for the, you know, through the summer months, and then we'll come back uh, in full flow uh, come um, uh, come the uh, early autumn. But I'll tell you more about that in another episode. Right, so all that remains me to do is to say thank you very much for watching. Thank you for your support of HDPP, and thank you for making it so special for everybody. We all play our part here. So until next week, remember to keep it live, keep it HDPP, and I'll see you then. Take care. Ta-da.
Oh, hello. Fancy you lot coming back here after all that. Yes, this is the part of the programme, actually. Uh, in fact, can I can I just ask VT, can you put me on the bigger screen? You know that you know the big. Thank you. That's better. Um, I just like to stretch out a bit here. Uh, now then, uh, dad jokes, which is what we normally do. We don't talk about this part of the program. Who would? Let's face it. But uh, I've been trying to find some dad jokes for you tonight, and <laughs> I'm just wondering whether I ought to do these or not. To be a perfect loss, because some are a bit risky. But I think I'm going to go for it because I'm feeling very cheeky tonight. Okay then. <laughs> I think I can get away with this. Right then. <clears throat> Actually, I'm just going to get this run by Mrs. G. Can I do this, these jokes, Mrs. G? <laughs> She's giggling. It must be all right. Um, <laughs> okay, here's uh, a few ways to tell a man that his zip is undone. Ladies, are you paying attention? You're going to like this. <laughs> I can't believe I'm going to do this, but I'm going to do it. Okay, <clears throat> so uh, a few ways to tell a man that his zip is undone. The cucumber has left the salad. <laughs> or <laughs> your soldier isn't so unknown anymore. <laughs> Elvis Jr. has left the building. <laughs> You've got your zip set for Monica instead of Hillary. <laughs> Men are from Mars, women can see... No, we won't do that. <laughs> or, um, uh, there's somewhere I really didn't have a chance to go through a few tonight. To, I always go through, find the ones, oh yeah, I can do that one. Um, I wonder if I can find you one late one here, but all these... Uh, uh, here, here we go. How about this? Uh, now, this one is quite... This is quite good. I like this one. Toilet paper. What a rip-off. <laughs> <laughs> now, that's a good one. <laughs> And finally, did you hear about the constipated accountant? He couldn't budget. <laughs> Thank you. And on that note, good night. <laughs>